believe that the reason why I root for dynasties is because those people that do something extraordinary and do it over and over and over again, they teach us not so much about who we are, but they teach us something about who we might become. So I'm rooting for excellence on steroids. Now, that's a, there's a connection I want to make for you here. Here was me for years and years and years working with executives all kinds, of all kinds and never meeting one that I would say was truly remarkable. Some very good ones, by the way. And yet I have this yearning to be in the presence of remarkable. So I decided to go on this journey that I would meet these remarkable leaders. I sent an email to uh, tons of people and asked them, who do you know that's a remarkable leader? And interestingly, about 80% I got back and said, I don't know of any. I don't know of people that describe who you are. Fortunately, I got enough, uh, enough back and I started on my journey. So I'm going to give you this, sh show you this piece of information here. This is a little bit of research, by the way, that relates to this. And you'll notice here that there's a relationship between leadership effectiveness and employee commitment. No surprise there, most of us would say, yes, as the leaders become more effective, employee commitment rises. And so there's a direct relationship between the quality of leadership and the degree to which the employees experience the workplace. No surprise there. But here's a little bit of piece of interesting information right there. You'll notice that as leadership rises, so does employee commitment, but there's a point where it takes quite a leap. And I would say that's my experience in the world, that when I'm around somebody who's a great leader, and when employees and you and others are exposed to great leaders, something happens where our experience takes quite a leap. So it's not just my interest, not just because I'm fascinated with greatness, I believe there's a correlation between great leadership and something that stirs in the imagination of people in life. So uh, here I am on this journey. What did I do? So um, I noticed, I did a little bit of research on Amazon. I'm I, by the way, I've been looking at, re uh, at leadership for about 30 years. I did my doctoral dissertation on the subject of leadership. So this has been a fascinating thing for me for a long time. I quickly did a, a search on Amazon and found that there are 6,000 books on leadership published and still available, an extraordinary amount. I also looked at some of the research that showed the degree of confidence in the United States and in the world in leadership. Here's an interesting piece of information for you. Confidence has been at about 30 to 50 percent based on all the studies you would ever look at on leadership. Confidence in leadership is about 30 to 50 percent on just about all walks of life. Here's another piece of research that shows this. This is the um, folks in Kennedy School of Government. This is uh, 2008, so it's a couple years old, but the, the data shows the same. If you look at all, uh, all the research on all the different walks of life, our confidence in leadership in only three sectors or four sectors is more than the middle level. There's a moderate amount of confidence in me military, medical, and nonprofit and charitable. If you go all the way down here in business, you can see a very, very modest level of confidence in leaders in business. Now you might say, well, that's, maybe that's the economy. But it turns out that if you look at this research over the past 30, 40 years, the data is roughly the same. I'll show you a little bit of research the past five years. This is, again, the Kennedy School of Government data. And the average confidence is actually going down a little bit on all it's an interesting phenomenon here, by the way. This is a little bit unrelated to my talk, but uh, oh, five years ago, it was quite tight, confidence and leadership of all these different sectors. And then somewhere around 2000 and 2000, 2007, 2008, it spread out. I think that has to do with the economy, and it gets uh, more turbulence in the economy, creates more upset in life, and so it disperses. But this general phenomenon, the average confidence is somewhere around 40%. That has remained for five years, and if we kept going back in time for 40 years, it would still be the same. So here's the question that I started to formulate in my mind. 6,000 books on leadership, a ton of information, a ton of research on leadership. You and I and just about everybody else could read books, go to workshops, and learn about leadership, and yet the quality of leadership, in my estimation, at least based on this research, is not going up. Why is that? I think it's because we're looking at leadership in the wrong place. I think it's because when we think about leadership, we think about what are the five easy steps? What are the five secrets to leadership? 
What are the five behaviors or seven behaviors or three keys to leadership that you or I could learn? And if we learn that, we too would be a great leader. Well, those five or seven or three steps to leadership have been available for 30 years, 50 years, 100 years in all the research, and yet leadership is not going up. I would suggest it's because it's not in the five easy steps. You can't get to great leadership from there. So I went out to meet with these great leaders to discover what is it, what is that secret ingredient that's deeper than the five steps, the five easy ways to great leadership that I might discover by meeting and sitting with some great leaders. I went on this journey, and um, by the way, if we were to ask the question, what are the qualities of great leadership? And I ask this all the time from a lot of different people. We come up with the same answer, vision. They, great leaders see the big picture. Great leaders have great focus. They have drive and determination. They have courage. They have integrity, et cetera, et cetera. We know these things. We know the qualities of great leaders. And yet, in spite of knowing it, in spite of reading about it, in spite of learning, in spite of going to all the workshops you can imagine, it doesn't make you or I a greater leader. Again, I was looking for the essence of what leadership is all about. So I met with um, uh, a number of people. My criteria for selection is that the leader had to be leading a groundbreaking organization, that the organization had to be doing something extraordinary in the world. One of the leaders I met was Mary Taverna, who brought the hospice movement here to the United States. I would say she was a brown, groundbreaking leader. Uh, they had to be CEO, president, executive director, or CEO of the organization, and that the quality of the culture had to be a direct result of the leader. I got a chance to meet about every two weeks for almost two years with an extraordinary leader. And I sat down for about two hours with each of these leaders, asking the question of them, what makes you tick? It was a little bit like My Dinner with Andre, which is a movie that most of you probably aren't familiar with, but came out about 30 years ago. Two people sitting, having dinner together for two hours at a restaurant. And this is what I got a chance to do. And can, you can imagine just that experience in and of itself. Uh, I would say it was life-changing for me. And it was life-changing because not so much about what they said, but how they presenced themselves. So some of the leaders I met with are uh, listed here. I'm going to blow by this real quickly so I can get to the essence of what I want to say to you. This is the first leader I met, Chauncey Starr. Chauncey is the founder of the Electrical Power Research Institute, which most of you may not be familiar with, but because electricity is a commodity, in other words, the electricity, you plug into the wall, you plug into a cord in the wall here, and you plug it in elsewhere, all over the world you get the same stuff. He figured out, he had the realization that, well, if electricity is a commodity, then there's not much research and development going into producing better electricity which is partly why we use the same methods for producing electricity now that we did 100 years ago. Because it's a commodity. It's hard to improve on that juice that comes out of the wall. He realized that with so much little investment in electricity, he had to figure out how do we, cre how do we create conditions where the utility industries are going to put efforts into improving electricity. He figured out, well, what if we pulled them all together? And he created the Electrical Power Research Institute. I met with Chauncey. He's a 93-year-old man. And he's still, he was still working full-time at age 93. I met him at the cafeteria at the Electrical Power Research Institute. He's hobbling to his seat in the cafeteria, sits down very slowly. He pulls out this sandwich. Sandwich is made of avocado and tomato. And he says to me, I have to eat carefully. I have to keep my cholesterol down. My doctor tells me that it's going to extend my life, and so I have to be very careful. As he eats very slowly his vegetarian sandwich, I asked a friend of mine who had introduced me to Chauncey, why does Chauncey work at age 93 full time? My friend said to me, because Chauncey doesn't want to die until he solves the energy crisis on the planet. That's the people that I met in my journey. Almost all of them did not have an ambition the way in, you, in, way in which you and I think about ambition. 
almost all of them were driven by something deeper. So what I'm going to share with you very briefly in a few minutes is the three things that I believe course through these leaders such that all of those other qualities that we think of when we think of leadership naturally arise. They arose in Chauncey. The first thing is a deep sense of purpose. All of the leaders that I met, Chauncey was the poster child for it, were driven by a deeper purpose. They were not thinking about how do I make more money. They were not thinking about how do I move up the ladder. How do we become more and more successful personally? They were thinking like Chauncey, how do I make a bigger difference in the world? And that's how you get to be age 93 and still want to work full time. Another example of a leader I met, this guy here, uh, Jerry Jampolsky. Jerry, around age 50, uh, was a psychiatrist working in a hospital. And one day he was walking by a, uh, a ward in the hospital where the kids were uh, uh, dying. They had cancer and they were kind of a death ward in the hospital. And he had been walking past this ward for, I don't know, maybe a thousand days in his life. And one day he decides to stop. And he goes into the ward. Who knows why he was inspired to do that? He goes into the ward and he asks some kid, about his life. And the kid all of a sudden lit up a little bit. All of a sudden got very excited. And Jerry got into this conversation with the kid. The next day Jerry went back and started to talk with a couple kids. And then all of a sudden these kids started to circle around Jerry. Days and weeks went by, he would go back to this ward. And every day the kids would get so excited to have somebody pay attention to them to the point that Jerry realized that the key ingredient for these kids is that somebody's caring about them as human beings, as alive, living human beings, not as somebody who's about to die. He shuts down his practice, his psychiatry practice, and for two years, no pay, no income, goes and visits these kids. Two years later, his secretary says to him, you can't pay me anymore, you've run out of money, you have no money. He says, I don't care, I'm going to keep doing this. I won't tell you the story about how he revived, but what I'm telling you is that this man, who by the way has now created 132 centers across the world devoted to helping people who are dying have, have a full life, he's an extraordinary leader. He's a leader driven by purpose, willing to let go of all in service of something deeper inside of him. All of the leaders that I met had the same quality. They were not ambitious for themselves. They were not thinking, in fact, many of them said when I, when I introduced myself to them, they said, why did you choose me? I'm not such a great leader. And then I would ask them, well, who are you then? How do you think of yourself? And Jerry and Chauncey and the others would say, well, I'm a person on a mission. I'm a person aiming to bring this to the world. So all of these qualities, this clear sense of purpose, results naturally in vision, naturally in strategic ability, naturally in focus and determination. This is Mimi Silbert. Mimi is the poster child for integrity. There's no way I'm going to make it through this talk in enough time, but I'm going to uh, go quickly to this. The second quality that I found is that all of the leaders that I met didn't have values, but they were their values. Mimi Silbert, who's the founder of the Delancey Street Foundation, works with thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are on the streets, who are multiple felons, who are gang leaders and drug, drug uh, dealers. And they all come to her world and live with her. She's now had 15,000 people exposed to the work that she does. And she would say the key ingredient to what changes these people's lives is one simple thing. They live by a simple set of rules and values. She lives with these people daily, and she has for 30 years, and she feels safe among people that you and I would not feel safe because they stick with these values. She is not having values, she is her values. So um, I would say that anchored in one's values, clear about one's values, and being immovable and impeccable is the second ingredient that naturally gives rise to these things we call integrity, trustworthiness, courage, and determination. It flowed through all of the leaders I met. 
And the third quality, very quickly, this is Banis Hudson. Banis is the uh, former CEO of LensCrafters and former CEO of BevMo. BevMo is a, a, a company that's been quite successful in the past tw uh, 10 years. He took it over when they were um, about to go bankrupt and then revived it to a company that is now quite thriving. Banis, you would think, when you think about leaders, you think about people who are, uh, have these big desks, big offices, uh, awards all over to show people how wonderful they are. Banis had this little office, 10 by 10. Instead of the secretary greeting me, he greeted me. And the first question out of his mouth was, so tell me, Keith, a little bit about yourself. Here's a man who I was there to interview about his greatness, to learn about what, what makes him so wonderful, and he was interested in me. And I began to notice in meeting with Banis, and I began to connect it to all the other leaders that I met, that each leader was comfortable in his or her skin. That is that they didn't need to shout, they didn't need to boast, they didn't need to show all the wards that, you know, here I am with President uh, Bush or President uh, Obama, they didn't have all those accoutrements that we think of when we think about great leaders. They were very humble and comfortable in their skin. Nothing to prove, nothing to show. And I began to realize that they were also very quiet in their voice, solid in who they are. So the three qualities that I saw in meeting with these leaders every two weeks for two years, clarity of purpose, anchored in their values, comfortable in their skin. I think of it as a rock-solid sense of self. That is that I know who I am and I'm good with who I am. And my message to you and my message to myself is stop reading all the books about leadership. Stop going to the workshops with the belief that if I got that, then I too would become a great leader. If I want great leadership, it comes from within. Get clear about who I am get clear about what I'm about in the world, and get solid with who I am. And if I do that, I will naturally bring out vision. Naturally, I'll live with integrity. And naturally, I'll inspire others.